Doings of Doyle is sponsored by Belanger Books, home of the best Sherlock Holmes anthologies featuring today's top Sherlockian authors. Belanger Books is the only authorised publisher of Solar Ponds Mysteries, continuing the Sherlock Holmes legacy into the 21st century. Visit them today at belangerbooks.com. Welcome to Doings of Doyle, a podcast dedicated to the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Professor Challenger, Brigadier Gerard, and, of course, Sherlock Holmes. I'm Mark Jones. And I'm Paul Chapman. And together we'll be exploring Doyle's eclectic bibliography to understand more about the great man's life and work. We'll be discussing his fiction and non-fiction, the well-known and the obscure. And stopping by Baker Street along the way. You can find out more at doingsofdoyle.com or follow us at doingsofdoyle on Twitter. Welcome to episode six, and today we have a very macabre tale for you, The Case of Lady Sanax, one of Conan Doyle's medical stories from his Round the Red Lamp series, first published in 1893 and still shocking to this day. Now, this was a story that Paul and I were both keen to do. It's one that we really enjoyed reading the first time, and we really enjoyed reading it again. It is a hallmark piece of uh, gothic storytelling by Conan Doyle. If there is one short story that you read, aside from the Sherlock Holmes short stories, this is the one to go for. And with that in mind, we warn you that uh, this is going to be a spoiler-filled discussion. If you haven't read the story, go and pick up a copy. You'll find a link to it in the show notes, and uh, and have a good read before proceeding with the podcast. So, Paul, can you let us know what happens in the case of Lady Sanax? Douglas Stone is one of the most outstanding young surgeons operating in 1890s London. He is also one of the least morally restrained. His sensual excesses are infamous, as is his affair with the former actress Marion Dawson, now Lady Sanex. One night, as he prepares for another appointment with his mistress, Stone receives a visitor, a bearded Turkish gentleman whose wife requires an emergency operation on her lip after cutting herself with a poisoned dagger. The surgeon hesitates, but the fee is too attractive. He operates on the veiled patient to remove the infected lip. There is a blood-choked scream. The veil is removed. And in the shock of recognition, Stone's brilliant mind lurches into madness. He has kept his appointment with Lady Sanex, whose husband is a vengeful man. So that gives you a real flavour for the gothic masterpiece that is the case of Lady Sanex. The story came about because Conan Doyle was approached by Jerome K. Jerome, the editor of the Idler magazine in summer 1892, and asked to write a series of six to eight short stories for the Idler. Um, There's a sense in which Jerome was trying to mirror the success of the Sherlock Holmes stories in the Strand magazine, and he asked Conan Doyle, I want something very strong to follow my novel notes, which will end about February. Now, what do you say to giving yourself a rest a while now and then taking up for me a complete series of six or eight stories to commence in March and run straight away? Then we could advertise this series and make it a feature of the magazine. Now, originally, it appears that the intention was for the six to eight stories to be linked and perhaps there was a a linking narrator or a linking main character. But that seems to have been abandoned in the development quite early on. Yeah, it seems to have been abandoned in this series, but it may have re-emerged um, in, in a, a, a later set of stories Conan Doyle did for the Idler in 1895, uh, which were essentially an episodic novel, uh, which appeared under the title The Stark Munro Letters, which was a, a semi-autobiographical stories of a young doctor's uh, struggles. And I, I certainly get the feeling that, that this might have come out of of this idea of of having a series of medical stories with one central linking character, uh, going from issue to issue to keep the readers interested. Yes, so Conan Doyle seems to have parked that idea, uh, as it were, and then refulfilled it with Mm. with the Stark Mm. Monroe letters. What he did in response to Jerome's request was he started to write a series of individual stories, and he does appear to have tested them out on different audiences. One of them was uh, famously The Curse of Eve, Uh, a story that he read to the Society of Authors meeting in December 1893, and it had a very downbeat ending, and Conan Doyle eventually rewrote the story. Uh, He did actually submit it as one of a number of stories to Jerome for the Idler, and uh, Jerome um, 
accepted it, but said, uh, let us have the others a little less sad. I dread the effect upon the sensitive reader. And in fact, it appears that there were only four stories ever submitted to the Idler for this series, or at least only four that we know of. There was The Curse of Eve, which in the end wasn't published, and three others, The Doctors of Hoyland, Sweethearts, and the subject of this podcast, The Case of Lady Sanax. None of these stories, I think, none of the three that were printed were realistic in the sense of describing medical realities and practicalities. And so um, they appeared ultimately in The Idler, whereas things that were much more medical in nature actually appeared later in a collected volume. The case of Lady Sanex first appeared in American newspapers in October 1893 and first appeared in the UK in The Idler in the following month. It was actually uh, sandwiched between the Naval Treaty Um, which appeared in The Strand magazine in October, and The Final Problem, where Sherlock Holmes disappears over the Reichenberg Falls in December 1893. So it comes out around the same time as what Conan Doyle believed were to be the final Sherlock Holmes stories, and consequently we believe that the case of Lady Sannox was written around the same time as uh, those stories, and that has some significance, as we'll come on to see. It appears that in the early months of 1894, Conan Doyle then worked on the collected version of the three stories and added 12 others in the form of the book that became known as Round the Red Lamp, being Facts and Fantasies of Medical Life, published by Methuen in 1894. The, the book seems to have gone through a number of titles at various times. It was In a Doctor's Waiting Room or Tales of a Physician's Waiting Room, Under the Red Lamp, and Dream and Drama was another such title. Yes, and even Conan Doyle himself recognised that Dream and Drama wasn't a particularly good title. He he, he almost apologised for it in, in a letter to uh, one of his literary mentors, James Payne. So let's focus in on the case of Lady Sanox. And this is a story that really showcases Conan Doyle's brilliance as a short story writer. There are a few moments in this story that really stand out for me. The first is the opening paragraph, which in the matter of 150 words, Conan Doyle manages to paint this incredible incident that we are going to see unfold in front of us. We know that an incident has occurred that has uh, led a beautiful socialite to withdraw from polite society and a genius doctor to to essentially become a, a drooling idiot. And we are left hanging at the end of that first paragraph, uh, finding out what it is that has happened The second moment for me that really horrifies me and horrified me when I read it originally as a teenager and again just rereading it now is the um, moment towards the end when Douglas Stone is to perform the operation on the veiled lady and there is a moment when you think that Douglas Stone is going to be redeemed. He is not going to perform this operation and instead he is threatened with Uh, his fee being withdrawn by this mysterious Turk. And instead, Douglas Stone goes ahead with the operation with this incredible speed. And we're left with the whole consequence of the operation unfolding before us. And you get this real sense of Douglas Stone's mind disintegrating in the description of what is happening in that strange back room off the Euston Road. It's a really evocative moment. And I think the speed and the pace and the way in which Doyle handles uh, both the setup and the denouement is is really masterful in this story, and the, the actual quality of the of the writing and the phrasing is is is, is wonderful as well. I mean, I, I, in particular, I, I love Conan Doyle's description of Douglas Stone near the start of the story, where he he says his vices were as magnificent as his virtues and infinitely more picturesque. Mm. It's just brilliant, mm. fantastic, fantastic stuff. And that's just the start of Conan Doyle laying out the personalities of the three main characters in the story. And there are only uh, three characters. You've been looking into the origins of uh, some of the names. Yes, I, I, I think um, there's, there's, these are just you know possible origins. But Lord Sanex, uh, for instance, Sanex is you know, it's a pretty unusual name. But um, Sanex is, is actually a point on the, the Isle of Arran. Um, mm. Off the northwest coast of Scotland, and Doyle had actually um, had a, a holiday on Arran in August and September 1877 uh, in the company of his uh, little sister Lottie and uh, his school friend James Ryan. 
and and there was an incident which occurred uh, there, which which he noted in the letter, um, and said, "Did you notice in the Scotsman that the sea serpent had been seen close to Brodick here, off the Sanex Rock?" So I think that the, the name Sanex is uh, you know stuck in his mind, and it reappears in this story. Of of, of the the other two characters, Marion Dawson, who is Lady Sanex herself. Um, when Conan Doyle was on holiday in Switzerland in the summer of 1893, that summer where he first saw the Reichenbach Falls and decided mm. uh, Sherlock Holmes's fate, um, one of his um, walking companions on that was the uh, the editor of the Christian magazine, The Young Man, uh, the Reverend W.J. Dawson. Again, the name may just have stuck in his mind. Uh, and uh, another thing that happened in the summer of 1893 was that Louise Conan Doyle uh, was confirmed in a diagnosis of what they then called galloping consumption. And the uh, the ultimate confirmation of that diagnosis was by um, the eminent Sir Douglas Powell. And I just wonder if, if the name of this eminent surgeon, Douglas, again um, became transferred to, to Douglas Stone. Yeah, I don't think there's anything uh, meaningful in it, but it's just one of those, those things where mm. he'd retained the name. Mm. I think if anything is um, symbolic in any of the names, it is... Um, Stone as the surname of the eminent surgeon because there is very much that idea that uh, he is a, a heartless individual. He is absolutely obsessed and he's it's this sort of uh, sensualism that actually leads to his downfall but he's also cold and unempathetic and, uh, uh, and heartless and Stone could well be a, an echo of that. Mm. You know, one of the things that's quite problematic about the story is that the the title character, Lady Sanex, does not really appear in the story as such. She doesn't have any agency. And and the moral judgments placed on her start right from the very beginning. She is the notorious Lady Sanex. Um, she has a liking for new experiences and was gracious to most men who wooed her. Gracious to most men who wooed her. Again, this is his Doyle and his, his wonderful phrasing. That is so loaded. Mm. Um, and, and a similar case is two years earlier where we're in a scandal in Bohemia where Irene Adler, the actress and singer, was readily characterised as uh, Irene Adler of, of dubious and questionable memory. Yes, and again, this Lady Sanex is, a, is, an, is an actress, at the acting profession mm. being synonymous with prostitution. Yes, actress being, in many cases, a euphemism. Yeah, absolutely. And you can contrast the treatment of Lady Sanex and the moral judgments passed on Lady Sanex to the way in which Douglas Stone is presented, who's presented much more as a, a, a celebrated physician, a great genius of surgery. He's, he's, he's uh, celebrated for his, his professional brilliance, um, but there's also a sly admiration of his, shall we say, immoral character within the, the gentlemen's clubs. Uh, mm. Stone isn't the one who's condemned within this world. It, it's Lord Sanex for, for putting up with his wife's behaviour. Yes, Conan Doyle's really good on the gossip that surrounds Lord Sanex. At one point he says, Did he know his lady's ways and condone them, or was he a mere blind, doting fool? It was a point to be discussed over the teacups in snug little drawing rooms, or with the aid of a cigar in the bow windows of clubs. But you, there is a darker side to Lord Sanex, and it is laid out quite quickly in a couple of fleeting references. The first, which is a real clue, is that uh, while we've said that uh, Lady Sanex was herself an actress, it is said that uh, Lord Sanex uh, was, a, was an actor and was involved in the theatre. And when discussing the um, gossip that surrounds Lord Sanex, Conan Doyle has this uh, apparently uh, humorous line that uh, actually has a deeper meaning to it. He says... Um, there was but one person who had a good word to say for Lord Sanex, and he was the most silent member in the smoking room. He'd seen him break in a horse at the university, and it seemed to have left an impression upon his mind. You, you've, you've got two things going on here. You've got the, uh, the silent member of the club, the observer, the one who really knows what's going on, and then he's thinking about Lord Sanex breaking in a horse, which again means he's observed and knows that Lord Sanex has this hard and mean streak. Mm. And as the story unfolds, we get to realise that um, Lord Sanex has really planned in very fine detail everything that is going to happen in this story. He has planned the downfall of both his wife and Douglas Stone to absolute perfection. This is the ultimate premeditated revenge. 
Um, and so those little clues as to Lord Sanox's capabilities and his his um, strength of character and strength of mind that are laid down very, very discreetly early on in the story really lay the foundations for the end of the story and for the for the shocking conclusion. And the high drama of this uh, gothic revenge is illustrative of uh, a particular literary influence, we think, on this story, uh, the, the Conte Cruel. Yes, this was a, a French school of, of a particular type of, of, of dark little story. In, in his uh, introduction to the Deedless book of 19th century French horror, uh, Terry Hale describes the, the, the style as, as grim little moral fables, um, which, which sums them up quite nicely. The main impetus for the development of, of this style uh, was, was the influence of Edgar Allan Poe, uh, on the French literary scene, following um, the translations of Poe by uh, Charles Baudelaire in the uh, 1850s, uh, which ha- had a great impact. Poe's I- ideas were taken and, and transposed in a ver- very Gallic way into this uh, this 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 school of of the Conte Cruel. Um, probably the the most famous writer in 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 this style was. Um, Villiers de Liladon, who actually his most famous work is simply titled Conte Cruel. Mm. Uh, but there are also other writers uh, like Charles Crow and Catullo Mendes. As, as well as the grim little moral fable element, um, these stories often had a, a cynical touch to them as well. And although he wasn't strictly part of this school per se, uh, Guy de Maupassant was very much in this style uh, when, when he could turn on his, his, his more cynical voice. Uh, and he was a great influence on on Conan Doyle. Uh, the several points in Letters and in um, Through the Magic Door, where Doyle is very specific in in his praise of uh, the stories of Guy de Maupassant. In fact, we know from the evidence of uh, Through the Magic Door that Conan Doyle was reading a volume of Guy de Maupassant's stories in the late summer of 1893, which would be about the time he was writing or contemplating writing The Case of Lady Sannox. And around the time that he's reading uh, Guy de Maupassant and he's planning the case of Lady Sannox, as we said earlier, he's also writing the, what he thinks are going to be the final adventures of Sherlock Holmes um, with the Naval Treaty and um, the final problem. And I think Charles Prepelec has said in his review of the case of Lady Sannox for his blog that there's a strong feeling of Baker Street around many of the elements within the case of Lady Sannox. The, the fact that the Turk arrives at um, Douglas Stone's house at a time where the rain is lashing against the window pane and it's almost as though a client is arriving on the scene. There's almost a sense in which you could feel the case of Lady Sannox was an early idea for a Sherlock Holmes story that just then wouldn't fit within the mode of Sherlock Holmes mm-hmm. stories and was transposed into a, a different genre, as it were. You also get this in one of the uh, the other Round the Red Lamp stories, uh, The Third Generation, uh, where the, um, the, the the patient arrives in the lashing rain and disturbs the uh, the learned specialist who's comfortably ensconced in his home and and is suddenly called out to um, to, to to be met with a, a a very grim little story. Yeah, and Douglas Stone is, in many ways, very similar to Sherlock Holmes. Um, I think it's been said before that the the model for Sherlock Holmes, in certainly in studies in Scarlet, is is the consulting physician, and um, you know there is a, there are some echoes between Holmes and, and Stone. Yeah, there, there there are quite a lot uh, when when you when, when when you look at this particular story. I mean, the the, the very title, the case of Lady Sannox, sounds like it could be a detective story. Yeah. Uh, from the beginning, um, but also Stone similarities to to. Sherlock Holmes, uh, he, his brilliance and standing in his chosen occupation uh, is similar to Holmes's as a detective. Uh, he, he has his wider potential. Uh, it's said of Stone, those who knew him best were aware that famous as he was as a surgeon, he might have succeeded with even greater rapidity in any well, any of a dozen lines of life. And we know from Holmes he could have been a, a forensic scientist or even a great actor. Or a criminal. <laughs> it, absolutely, yes. <laughs> The stone physically operates in 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 Holmes's home territory. Um, again, of stone, his energy, his audacity, his full-blooded self-confidence. Does not the memory of them still linger to the south of Marylebone Road and the north of Oxford Street? This is where Baker Street is, of course. Mm. Um, he even speaks like Holmes. 
uh, when the when the uh, Turkish gentleman calls on him, he says, "You will remember that I have an appointment, sir." Said the surgeon with some irritation. "Pray confine yourself to the necessary details." Mm. It's all very very Holmesian. It is, um, and and as much as um, Douglas Stone is a sensualist, and you wouldn't mm. see that with yeah, that's, that's the, the the one major difference between the two men. Yeah. But you do, you do still have the um, you know his his whole bohemian soul. You oh have, yes, and his um, indulgence in the seven percent solution, etc. Absolutely. Mm. So there, there are while he's not um, one for the ladies, shall mm. we say, in the same way as Douglas yeah. Stone, you still have an, an element of the bohemian indulgences about yeah, that definitely. Sherlock Holmes as well. So what do we think this story is all about? Because it doesn't seem to have a very clear moral lesson. It's, it's, it's rather curious to work out what's, uh, what's being said in this story, because of the three main characters, they're, they're all pretty dislikable, uh, and they're, they're, all, they're all very, very flawed. Uh, you have Douglas Stone, who might be brilliant at his profession, but he's, he's morally totally flawed, doesn't seem to care about anyone else. Um, you, you've got Lord Sannox who marries this young actress. We we don't know the background. I, I you, know, you presume it's a love match on his side at, at the very least, mm. um, but it, it seems to sour very very quickly. Uh, I mean, the the, the theatre brings them together, uh, but then Conan Doyle tells us that since his marriage, this early hobby had become distasteful to him. Yeah. Um, presumably his wife had become distasteful to him as well uh, and and he instead he, he's he's happier in his garden he's happier with a spud and a watering can among his orchids and chrysanthemums mm. so yeah with with the marion dawson you wonder what 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 what's in it for her um it, it doesn't come across that she's got any great love for lord sanex um but it is mentioned uh, that he had offered his hand to her his title and the third of a county so that uh, presumably helped to win her over yeah. somewhat, uh, and then she's off uh, having having affairs. It's quite clear from the writing that the Douglas Stone isn't her only infidelity. Uh, so this is all. This is a group of of, of pretty dislikable characters. Yeah. Uh, and then when you get into the the story itself, this is this is a, a clearly very well plotted revenge. And, and and very unpleasantly carried out, uh, and then once the the operation has happened, and and Lady Sanex has had part of her her lip removed, um, Lord Sanex's comment is: it was really very necessary for Marion this operation, not physically, but morally. You know, morally. Hmm. He's um, it's described as as she takes the veil, and and the fact that she's had. A chunk of her lip cut out. This is this is the classic, shutting the woman up. Yeah, it is. I mean, th- and it is more of an exp- It feels to me more like an exploration of revenge than it does of infidelity. The infidelity is not really explored. This is just about the infidelity is the spur for the revenge. Mm. Um, I mean, that th- it was a very gendered attitude to inf- infidelity in Victorian, in the Victorian era. I mean, we know that if you look at the the, the divorce law that was in effect. At the time of uh, the case of Lady Sanex, then it was based on the, Matri- the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857, which actually allowed a man to divorce um, by proving adultery, while a woman actually had to prove adultery plus aggravating circumstances. She had to um, prove cruelty or rape or sodomy or a whole range of different things as well. Bestiality, absolutely. These, these were all on the, on the list. Yeah, and, and men could claim compensation um, from... Um, uh, the the offending party, as it were, you know, Lord Sanex could claim uh, uh, compensation from Douglas Stone in this case, but women couldn't do uh, the same because technically they were regarded as an extension of uh, as, as the man's property, mm. and and that imbalance remained in law until um, the the Act was updated in 1923. It's quite it's quite staggering, but that theme of infidelity does come out a few times in Conan Doyle's other writings. I mean, probably the one that's most relevant to this uh, story is the retirement of Signor Lambert, which is written in 1898. Yes, yeah, so Lambert uh, the, uh, could, could be seen as, as a companion piece to, mm. to Lady Sanex. Um, it, it, it's actually the, the other way around this, this time. The, um, 
the character who has the operation performed upon them is is the male character this time the uh, the golden voiced singer Cecil Lambert who has his his beautiful vocal cords removed by the engineering magnate Sir William Sparta who <laughs> has used his knowledge of engineering to teach himself basic home do it yourself surgery even even to the and not suspicious at all behaviour of going to a doctor and asking him how to operate on vocal cords. It's a, yeah, this is really not a highlight of Conan Doyle's writing. No. And um, but it is essentially the same story replayed, isn't it? It, it, it is, yes. And, and unfortunately, it loses something in the retelling. Yeah, very much so. And the other story that really leaps out as dealing with the topic of infidelity is a Sherlock Holmes story. Is the cardboard box which was published in 1893. It's one of the most fascinating stories in the Sherlock Holmes canon, not least because Conan Doyle pulled it from inclusion in the in the collection called The Memoirs and added it to a later collection. It was clearly a little um, close to home or dealing with topics that he felt were unsuitable for the wider readership and the audience at the time. It deals with alcoholism and themes of manliness and castration, and our sympathies are very much with Jim Browner, the sailor whose wife has been unfaithful to him or believes to have been unfaithful to him as a result of the manipulation of his wife's sister. And it's a really tragic story. Yes, the, the, the faithlessness is, or, or the perceived faithlessness is even worse in that it would have been two sisters sharing one man. Yeah. Yeah, and on, on, on the issue of, of, of inappropriate marriages, um, there's the illustrious client um, and, and you think that Marion Dawson could have uh, perhaps done with uh, with some advice to stop her marrying Lord Sannox, uh, as Violet de Merville is prevented from marrying the totally inappropriate uh, Baron von Gruner. Mm. And while this all sounds like high melodrama, I think you can make the argument that Conan Doyle is also passing some ref- personal reflections on the medical profession. Medicine was increasingly professionalizing in the late 19th century. I mean, there'd been surgeons and apothecaries and healers and quacks for centuries. But actually, in uh, 1858, the Medical Act had been passed. The General Medical Council had been introduced. And from that point on, you needed to be formally registered to practice. And that led to codes of conduct to essentially try to um, prevent rogue doctors uh, bringing uh, disrepute on the profession and there were quite a few of them. I mean one of the classic case in point there is is George Budd, one of the uh, uh, one of the doctors that um, Conan Doyle met early in his career. Yeah and who, who um, took him down the wrong path for a while and uh, ultimately provided good material for the Stark Monroe letters. And it's notable that in the case of Lady Sannox, Douglas Stone is reputed to have been kicked out as vice president of one professional body because of his conduct. And there was a very clear hierarchy in uh, the medical profession with consultants at the top um, and then your GPs and then ultimately at the, boss, at the bottom were nurses. The number of GPs remained relatively static in the last few decades of the 19th century, but there was an enormous growth in the number of consultants and specialists. Conan Doyle was uh, one of those GPs who was trying to make the move to becoming a consultant. He moved to London shortly after meeting uh, Sir Malcolm Morris, who we referenced in Raffles Hall, um, himself a Harley Street consultant who had made good after starting out as a GP. Uh, and he moved to London to try to uh, develop his uh, to, to develop wealth and status. I think Roger Luckhurst at the Conan Doyle and London Symposium in uh, November 2019 argued that Conan Doyle went to London for status and wealth rather than knowledge, and that's illustrated in the uh, uh, part of London that he chose to settle in, exactly that part of London that is referenced as being between the Maryland mm-hmm. Road and the new Oxford Street. And there's a sense in which Conan Doyle might be taking his revenge on uh, the profession that he's recently turned his back on, or perhaps turned its back on him. Yeah, there's a, there's this a sense um, that certain um, parts of the medical profession and, and the literary world as well uh, looked upon Conan Doyle as as being um, at times rather too chippy and self-assertive. Yeah, and there is a lovely little piece of documentary evidence that might suggest that Conan Doyle was indeed putting some distance between himself and the medical profession in that, you know, around the time that he was writing uh, the Round the Red Lamp stories, or at least compiling it for um, publication as a book, he was also writing the very first Brigadier Gerard story, the Medal of Brigadier Gerard, and that manuscript is signed A. Conan Doyle, M.D., but the M.D. is scored through. So right at the time that he's pulling together 
around the red lamp, you know, he's he's writing out the MD bit from uh, from his from his work. And certainly Conan Doyle always takes the side of the GP. Um, one of the last stories of Round the Red Lamp, The Surgeon Talks, ends with a message about the role of the doctor, his place in society and the good he can do. Um, whereas surgeons in Conan Doyle stories tend to be rather more elitist and um, impersonal and see um, patients as, as, as a case only, something that you could level against Sherlock Holmes too. And surgeons tend to come a cropper in uh, Conan Doyle stories when they dabble in affairs of the heart. In the case of Douglas Stone, his sensualism, his obsession with Lady Sanex is absolutely his downfall. Uh, but you also get characters like Dr. Ainsley Gray in The Physiologist's Wife. And in the Sherlock Holmes stories, you also get um, Professor Presbury, the uh, renowned physiologist in The Creeping Man, who... Uh, is so obsessed with a younger woman that he takes monkey glands mm. to try to uh, rejuvenate uh, so he can uh, he can be a suitable match for yes, her. When, when man tries to rise above nature, he frequently falls below it. So Conan Doyle is dealing with uh, real issues in the case of Lady Sannox, but then there's also this wonderful stream of uh, Orientalism within the tale. Yeah, or Orientalism was one of the major cultural streams of the 19th century, particularly noticeable in paintings of the time. Um, but one of the things that had actually uh, fired up uh, was the, um, the the widespread popularity of the uh, the Arabian Nights, or the, the, the Thousand and One Nights. These had initially become well known in, in Western culture through the, uh, the, the, the French translations of Antoine Galland, uh, who wrote very popular uh, versions of these stories, which which before that time, certainly to to the uh, the, the the Westerner, they were they were merely oral tales. He collated them uh, and in in many ways Westernized, even Gallicized them. Um, uh, and this influenced a stream of of Orientalism later in the 18th century, which came out in a, in a lot of the, uh, the, the the Gothic revival. Um, thing in particular of William Beckford's novel Vatek, which was originally written mm. in French uh, in 1786. But the, in in terms of Victorian culture, uh, the Arabian Nights really uh, really move into the mainstream. Uh, with the appearance of E. W. Lane's uh, translation of the Thousand and One Nights, which came out in in 1841, uh, he was already a famous Orientalist scholar, um, celebrated as the author of Manners and Customs of the Modern Egyptians, which had been published in 1836, and which is usually known to this day as as, as Lane's Modern Egyptians. There was another translation done in 1885 to six by the uh, the more controversial uh, Oriental scholar Sir Richard Burton. Both his and Lane's versions were heavily annotated, and and Burton's were also heavily eroticized and were brought out in a subscriber's edition, and, and not as well known as Lane's. Uh, but these things also passed I I through the hands of, of of lesser writers, and 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 also moved into the nursery in in very Baudelaireized versions. At the time uh, Lady Sannox was written, the, these things were popular in, in, in the pantomimes. Um, this is when you really get the popularity beginning of, of um, Aladdin and um, Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves and... Um, Sinbad, I Sinbad, think. Sinbad, and the tales of Sinbad. So all this is entering into... into this isn't just high culture, this is this is entering into, into popular culture in a big way. So the tropes that Conan Doyle is using in this story, when uh, when Lord Sannox disguises himself as, as the Smyrna merchant, these are all very familiar um, images. Um, and, and also we were talking about the uh, the paintings earlier when when Douglas Stone goes into into this 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 room that Lord Sannox has has prepared it says uh, the floor was littered and the corners piled with Turkish cabinets inlaid tables coats of chain mail strange pipes and grotesque weapons this this is the uh, the absolute Orientalist studio it it, it, it reflects um, the the atelier for instance of, of the French French painter Theodore Ch uh, Chassariau, uh, whose whose studio Theophile Gautier, uh, the French writer and another 
French writer that, that Conan Doyle admired. Uh, he talks about going to this studio and, and looking at the barbaric charm of, of, of the painter's assembly of daggers, Circassian pistols, Arab guns, old Damascene blades and firearms embellished with silver and coral. So all this barbaric splendor, this is, this is the, uh, the world that, that, that Conan Doyle is channeling here. Um, but but there is, there's, there's, there's a point to all this. Mm. And that's taking us back to this theme of the iniquities of marriage. Yes, yeah. Conan Doyle is is simply using these uh, the, this this Oriental uh, Arabian Nights trope to to make a point. Um, the point being that Lady Sanex is 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 trapped in this this loveless marriage with Lord Sanex, and and he is absolutely in control of her, uh, and she has no more freedom than than um, a, a concubine within the, this kind of world of the harem. The, the westernized, eroticized, imagined world of the harem, where, where the pasha or the sultan is very much in charge. And there is a reading that this is a story about um, a male control over uh, female sexuality, Elaine Showalter in Sexual Anarchy, Gender and Culture in the Fin de Siècle, written in 1990, argued that Lady Sanex is a straightforward reference to female circumcision or female genital mutilation, uh, a practice of which the Victorians had become aware in the 1860s, though was largely um, discredited by the time that the, the decade was out. And, and uh, people like Richard Francis Burton had been um, part of bringing that to the attention of the Victorian audience. Yeah, yes, Bert Burton, you have to trust a lot of what he says at, at, at times, but you've got to be careful with, with the way Burton reads things. He He does sometimes wander off into, into the roles of an intellectualised sexual fantasy world. Mm. And th- this is kind of the world, I think, that, that again, Conan Doyle's tapping into a bit uh, with, with, with this story. And, and you, you, could, you could read Lady Sanex's violation as a, a, a disguised clitoridectomy. This, this we are talking about her lip being savaged here in a V shape. It's, it, the, the language mm. is very suggestive. Um, and what what is, is is particularly interesting as well with this talking about the this litter of weaponry that is always lying around in these these artist studios or so on. It, this this barbarically splendid weaponry. It isn't actually that which does the damage. It's the clinical westernized forceps and scalpel mm. that do the damage. So this is great ironic play going on here. Mm. There's another. Um Another interpretation along those lines as well, which is, which comes from Robert Darby, who edited uh, a version of Round the Red Lamp, uh, which included other medical writings that came out from Valancourt Press in 2007. It's a really good volume, and in it he argues that, as much as it's a, it could be a, a comment on a female clitoridectomy, it could also be a commentary on male circumcision, which was a live issue at the time, and that many of the arguments put forward by the Turk, uh, the reasons why... Douglas Stone should conduct the operation and many of the same reasons that uh, were put forward for male circumcision at the time. But then again, this, this could be reading too much into, uh, into this story. Um, it, it could simply be a case of facial mutilation uh, because th- this is a, another theme which recurs throughout Conan Doyle's fiction and particularly I- in the Sherlock Holmes canon. You just have to think of, of stories like The Man with the Twisted Lip, which isn't a real facial mutilation, but it's a disguise. But nevertheless, the, 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 the symbolic power of the facial mutilation is, is there in the story. Or the illustrious client, where Baron Gruner has his, his very handsome face ruined by vitriolic acid. And Watson describes it. The features which I had admired a few minutes before were now like some beautiful painting over which the artist had passed a wet and foul sponge. They were blurred, discoloured, inhuman, terrible. Or the veiled lodger, where the um, tragic heroine uh, has to disguise her, her horrendously mutilated face. Uh, and when she shows this face to two Holmes and Watson, again, the description is very strong. It was horrible. No words can describe the framework of a face when the face itself is gone. Two living and beautiful brown eyes, looking sadly out from that grisly ruin, did but make the view more awful. And it's also significant in um, Charles Augustus Milverton, 
Uh, another story with a very, very strong vengeance element mm. uh, when Milverton himself is shot uh, at the end of the story. It's, it, he isn't just shot. The lady who kills him, uh, after, after she has, has, has emptied several bullets into him, the woman looked at him intently and ground her heel into his upturned face. It's very, very strong yeah, stuff. Yeah, very, very strong stuff. And you definitely get the sense that Conan Doyle is horrified by the ideas of mutilations. I mean, mm. in, in The Surgeon Talks, um, again, at the end of the Round the Red Lamp series, one of the characters says at one point that uh, living with disfigurement or mutilation is worse than death. Mm. I mean, it, I think it was perhaps a profound fear of Conan Doyle. Mm. It's certainly something that you you spot time and again in his writing. And the, this, the in in those excerpts of uh, just read out, there's this there's pity mixed in with the horror. Yeah. Even for the you know, a character like Gruner, it, it it's described with 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 a degree of of sympathy for this man, despite all his crimes. Yes, this is the absolute worst mm. that could possibly mm. happen. Yeah. At the end of the day, uh, the case of Lady Sanex is an example of the high Gothic. It is a a gothic masterpiece, as we've said earlier. And if we could be in any doubt that uh, the audience at the time would have read it as a gothic story, you only need to look at how the story has been adapted. And one of the really interesting things about the case of Lady Sanex is that it was adapted for the stage very early on. In uh, 1899, a play was uh, put on by uh, Frank Marriott Watson entitled The Black Mask. The play concerns an evil husband... Henri Lenoir, who lives a second life as a villainous thief and murderer called the Black Mask, and uh, it's a it's a play of a prologue and three acts. In the prologue, Lenoir is uh, in competition with uh, Doctor Blackmore for the affections of Nellie Cunningham. Um, he kills Nellie's father and frames Blackmore, and then in Act One, uh, which is set seven years later, Nellie discovers that Lenoir is in fact. Um, the Black Mask. And then Act 2 is a straightforward lift of the case of Lady Sanex with uh, the Black Mask taking on the role of the Turk and uh, entrapping Dr. Blackmore. Although in this instance there is a, a happier ending in that uh, while Nellie Cunningham is sedated, um, she is able to just about see uh, Walter Blackmore through her veil and is able to alert him and so the operation doesn't ultimately take place. It's an interesting story because it, it does seem to have um, had the sanction of Conan Doyle. The play was put on originally in 1899 and then again in provincial theatres in, in 1900 and the Blackburn Standard reported at the time that one of the main situations in the play was adapted from Dr Conan Doyle's famous story, The Case of Lady Sanex, by special permission of the author of Sherlock Holmes. It actually goes on to say, the plot is a powerful one, is full of incident, and several of the situations have a strong human flavour that appears irresistible to the audiences. And that's a pretty good description <laughs> of the case of Lady Sanex. Um, just to give some background on, on the play, Frank Marriott Watson himself is, a, is, a, is an interesting figure. He was the son of Henry Crocker Marriott Watson, who was a, a clergyman and an early writer of uh, dystopian science fiction. Frank's connection to Conan Doyle appears to have been through his brother, Henry Brereton Marriott Watson, who was actually the assistant editor of the Black and White periodical, which had first published Conan Doyle's A Straggler of Fifteen in 1891, and also assistant editor of the Pall Mall Gazette, which uh, published The Mystery of Clumber in 1888 and uh, H.B. as he was known was very familiar with the literary circles of the time with Thomas Hardy, H.G. Wells, Henry James and uh, J.M. Barry, and actually wrote his own gothic short story collections notably Diogenes of London and uh, The Heart of Miranda which are still quite well regarded today. H.B. actually became a spiritualist around the time of the First World War and he corresponded with Conan Doyle in light so H.B. was probably the link from uh, Conan Doyle to Frank Marriott Watson, uh, although there's no documentary evidence to show um, any contractual relationship between Frank and Conan Doyle on, uh, for the rights to put on the play. But it's interesting that, you know, in, in taking the case of Lady Sanex and putting it on stage, it is put on in the form of a very high Victorian melodrama, uh, pantomime villain stuff. 
Frank Marriott Watson is able to lift the case of Lady Sannox and put it straight into that milieu without any real editing. The uh, uh, Act 2 is, is virtually a complete lift. And the case of Lady Sannox has also been adapted a couple more times. One adaptation that's particularly worthy of note is the CBS TV series Suspense, which, which adapted the case of Lady Sannox for broadcast uh, in December 1949. And um, a link to it is available in the show notes because you can see this on YouTube. It's a really good adaptation. It does make some enhancements, actually, to the original story. Lady Sannox is more brazen, if anything. She actually has another admirer who she plays off against Stone. And um, Stone is even more obsessed with Lady Sannox to the point of even offering to murder Lord Sannox at some point, which is interesting in that they're almost making the same connection back to the iniquities of the uh, divorce laws. Mm-hmm. In the, and, you, and you thought the characters couldn't get any worse. <laughs> yeah, and and Stone is reprimanded directly by the Royal College of Surgeons in the in the depiction. But the the actual really uh, great part of the of that uh, production is the actor Barry Kroger, who plays Lord Sannox, who is fantastic. He's meek and timid as Lord Sannox at the beginning, and completely different as the Turk, and then. Uh, at the end, in this version, he is uh, he's arrested. Um, the other adaptation, unfortunately, um, no longer exists. That was for a series called Late Night Horror uh, on the BBC in 1968. Famous series, this. It only lasted six episodes and was cancelled after the sixth. And the case of Lady Sannox, although they called it The Kiss of Blood, was actually the last one to be broadcast. It was cancelled because of so many audience complaints. Only one episode of it exists uh, if you if you doubt how horrific this story could be, you can just go and look at the title sequence that survives on YouTube because it is one of the most terrifying things going. The interesting thing there is that it was dramatised by John Hawksworth, who would go on to produce the uh, Granada TV Sherlock Holmes series. So it becomes quite obvious that the 20th century interpretations of this story are very clear-cut about its, its gothic nature. Um, and it, it's quite interesting that... Um, when Conan Doyle himself reprinted this tale in 1922, it was placed uh, in a volume entitled Tales of Terror and Mystery, which seem a far more fitting place for it, really, than than uh, a book which is ostensibly about medical stories. Mm. So that brings us to the end of this episode. If you've any questions or comments about the podcast, you can reach us on Twitter, where we are at Doings of Doyle, or via the website doingsofdoyle.com, where you can also find the show notes. And if you've enjoyed the episode, then please do leave us a rating or review on your podcast platform of choice. So, Paul, what are we going to be looking at next time? It's going to be rather a change of tone for the uh, the next show. Uh, (laughs) We're going to be looking at Conan Doyle's uh, set of pirate stories about Captain Sharky. That should be a bit of much-needed light relief. Aha, indeed. (laughs) So until then, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye.